Okay, let's get down to sermon time. I want to read to you today from the Gospel of Mark. And the scripture reading is Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. A very interesting story. So let us listen to the words of Mark. As Jesus continued down the road, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good except the one God. You know the commandments. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't cheat. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he responded, I've kept all these things since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him carefully and loved him. He said, you are lacking one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But the man was dismayed at this statement, and he went away saddened because he had many possessions. Looking around, Jesus said to his disciples, it will be very hard for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom. His words startled the disciples, so Jesus told them again, children, it's difficult to enter God's kingdom. It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter God's kingdom. They were shocked even more and said to each other, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them carefully and said, it's impossible with human beings, but not with God. All things are possible for God. Jesus said to this man, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. Wow, that is quite a say. That is a hard say. How do we take those words? Do we take those words literally? I don't think anybody in here has done that. Have you? Has anybody in here sold all that you had and given it to the poor to then come follow Jesus? I haven't. Throughout uh, 2,000 years of Christianity, basically the church has not taken this literally. A few people have. The most famous person that I know of in Christian history who took this literally was a man by the name of St. Francis of Assisi. Many of you may have heard of him. St. Francis of Assisi was born in uh, 1181, and he died in 1226. If you do some quick math, he was only 45 years old when he died. And, and Francis uh, was, a, as we understand, a, a wealthy man. He had, he had a pretty good life. And he read this story in the gospel. And he took it literally. And he sold all of his possessions, took all of his money, gave it to the poor, and spent his life in ministry to the Lord Jesus Christ. And all he had was clothes he wore on his back. But he always had en enough to eat. He always had a place to sleep. He has influenced thousands and thousands and thousands of people because today the uh, Catholic priests that are known as the Franciscans, you see, are followers of St. Francis of Assisi. So here's a man who took this literally. But most people don't. 
So what, what is the meaning of the story? I want us to look again at the story briefly, and then I want us to ask ourselves, what is the story saying to you and me and the church today? The story begins by saying that a man ran up and knelt before Jesus. So he ran to Jesus. This, this suggests uh, this man's excited. Uh, this man, has a, he's got a mission. He wants to get up there to where Jesus is. So he runs to Jesus. And he kneels down to Jesus, which shows a great deal of respect and humility. And then he asked Jesus the question, he says, what must I do to have eternal life? Well, that is the question of questions, isn't it? All of us want to live. What do I have to do to have eternal life? Jesus was Jewish. The man was Jewish. So naturally, Jesus pointed the man to the Jewish Bible, the Torah, the Jewish law, and he starts listing off some of the Jewish laws. And the man in interrupts Jesus, and he says, Oh, oh I've, I've, I've done all that since I was a boy. Now, when, when I hear the man say that, I have to smile. Because, let me ask you this. Who has kept all of God's law, all of the time. Nobody. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that a little bit later in this message and give you some scriptures to kind of emphasize that. But the fact of the matter is, nobody keeps all of God's law all the time. Now, I don't know if he was just naive or what. Uh, he may have been very sincere, but he, he was mistaken in thinking that he had always gotten everything just right. But that's what, that's what he thought. It's interesting that Jesus didn't really contest that with him. What Mark tells us is that in verse 21, Jesus looked at him carefully and loved him. And then Jesus said, well, you know, there is, there is one other thing you do need to do. You need to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then you come follow me and you'll find life. And the man was dismayed. And he was sad. And he walked away. And left Jesus. Because Mark tells us he had many possessions. So then Jesus looked around at his disciples and he says, It's very hard for a wealthy person to enter God's kingdom. The disciples were startled by that. And so as a point of emphasis, Jesus said it again. He tells them again in verse 24, Children, it's difficult to enter God's kingdom. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to go to heaven. Now there's one of Jesus' extreme exaggerations to make, to make his point. The disciples were shocked at this. And they, and they said to him, Well, then who can be saved? And Jesus' answer was, well, if it's up to human beings, nobody. But with God, everything's possible. So what does the story say? I believe this is a story that is told to the church to have us question our priorities. What is most important to us? Now, there's no denying it that in the Gospels, Jesus does challenge wealthy people. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 20, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then a few verses later in verse 24 of Luke 6, he says, Woe! 
to those who are rich, for they have received their reward. And in the same gospel, the gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, Jesus tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus. We all know that story, don't we? Have you ever really considered about how that story from Jesus is a very powerful and strong critique against the wealthy? And you see, the rich man in the story uh, had everything he needed. And there was this other man who was poor. His name was Lazarus. And he just wanted the crumbs from the rich man's table. The rich man was oblivious to Lazarus. He was anonymous. He was blind to the poor man. And then they die. And what happened? The great reversal. Jesus likes to teach stories with the great reversal. After they died, everything was different. Lazarus, the poor man, he is in heaven sitting beside Abraham. Now, why is that important to Jewish people? Abraham is the father of Judaism. So, man, he's got, he's got the, the seat right next to Abraham. And where's, where is, is the rich man? Well, he's in torment. See, the story is a powerful critique against the wealthy being blind to the poor. Paul the Apostle emphasized this point too. In two of his letters, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5, and Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, in both of those letters and both of those verses, he says this. He says, greed is idolatry. Greed is idolatry. Greed can become our God. Now, those, those things that Jesus says and those things that Paul says really ought to upset us, folks. I know you don't think you're wealthy, but listen, when you look at us compared to the world, we are the rich. And it, 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 it's, it's unsettling to me to, to hear what Jesus has to say and what Paul has to say about, about the wealthy. But yet having said that, I really think the application of this story is even broader than just talking about wealth. I think this story is asking us to ask ourselves, what is it that is most important in our lives? What is most important to you? What are your priorities? What are your goals? How do you spend your time? How do you live your life? I believe Jesus is saying in this story, think about that. Because however you answer that, that is your God. Now, when you think about that, you think, wow. Then how can we ever get it right? I mean, you think about all of the things in this life that pulls and tugs at us, all of the things there is for us to do, all of the ways there is for us to, to spend our time, all the different priorities and goals that we have. How can we ever get it right? We're all going to be pulled in, in all kinds of different directions. And that's why the disciples are saying, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, well, with humans, it, it, it is impossible. We're never going to get it right, folks. We're always going to have trouble with our priorities. The Apostle Paul said in the book of Romans, chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23, he said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're, we all, all, all of us are going to mess up. All of us are going to get our priorities out of whack. So this story speaks to all of us and reminds us we're going to get off course. And so Jesus reminds us in the story, it's only by God's grace that we have a chance. 
The disciples said, well, how in the world can anybody be saved if it's like that? And Jesus said, well, if it's up to human beings, it's impossible. But with God, everything's possible. So that is, that is Jesus reminding us that God saves us by his grace. Kind of reminds me of what Paul said in Ephesians 2. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, and anybody should boast. But the story reminds us of something else as well. The story reminds us that we have a choice in our lives. We decide which way we're going to go. God gives us that. Because in this story, the rich man turned around and walked away. And notice that Jesus did not chase after him. Jesus did not bargain with him. Jesus did not try to manipulate him. Jesus let him go. Now, whatever happened to the rich man? I don't know. I don't know if he ever came back or not. As far as the story in the gospel goes, as far as we know, he walked away, and that's the end of the story. We have a choice. You see, Jesus doesn't make us do anything. He invites us. I like that passage in uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, the uh, imagery of the passage. It says, Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. He knocks. Jesus doesn't kick the door in. He doesn't blow the house up. He doesn't go in and handcuff you and drag you out. He stands at the door and he knocks. And here's what he says is most important. Here's what's most important. That you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you love your neighbor as yourself. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.